And I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, the Wiradjuri, uh, not only because they're owners of the country, but they are owners of a knowledge tradition which is completely different from ours in the West. And one of the things, what I want to talk about is so the necessity. Yeah, we need to get Just that. We've got Mick here? Yeah. Yes, Can you good. hear me now? Yes. Okay. I will have to move the apparatus a bit. Okay, <clears throat> so as you can see, the title is Movement, Narrative and Multiplicity in Embodied Orientation and Collaboration from Prehistory to the Present. And what it's really about is cognition, navigation and stories across time and place. <clears throat> A couple of uh, writers on Polynesian navigation, and I'll be turning to that later, uh, <coughs> put what I want to say very neatly. Space is an integral part of the underlying cognitive and logical foundation upon which all humans depend and on which all human experience rests. At the same time, it's profoundly variable and an integral facet of the specific, localised, particular features of unique, subjective and culture-specific, intersubjective human experience. So, my main argument, to state the obvious, is cognition is not an abstract mental phenomena, despite the cognitive neurosciences and philosophy frequently treating it as if it's just thoughts or internal mental processes in individual brains. Cognition, as we all, I imagine, in this audience accept, is embodied. The fundamental sense is that it's, in the sense that it's both a neural and a bodily process, it's based in bodily movement, in activities and practices, but it is also profoundly social and cultural, and as such, it's distributed and diverse. So my basic proposition is that cognition and navigation are intertwined. Thought is embedded within and richly structured by space. But navigation, like cognition, is deeply embedded in forms of life, in different ways of knowing and being in the world, and has its origins in the prehistoric past. So I want to tell you three different but connected stories about ways in which embodied cognition can be understood as ed Ed Hutchins puts it as a cognitive ecosystem. And so the first story is my take on some recent developments in cognitive neuroscience. The second is about the early origins of human cognition. And the third concerns new ethnographic evidence of how, despite the divides, the radically different Polynesian and Western navigation traditions are enabled to work together through collaborative drawing. Taken together, these stories suggest ways of expanding the concept of a cognitive ecosystem to include the socio-cultural dimensions of social collaboration and multiple ways of conceiving space, time, narrative, complex interaction and relationship. Such an expansion may provide for a bridge across the divides between the arts and the sciences and between disciplines and knowledge traditions, which I take it to be the basic thematic of this whole conference. <coughs> and how many people here were at the first conference in Irvine? Uh, one? Uh, hardly anybody? Really? Okay. Uh, so, uh, I will give you my impression, and you'll have to assume that there's some veracity in that impression. <laughs> but my impression was that there was a great divide between what you might call the internalists focused on brain processes and the externalists focused on the body and the brain. But I think that kind of cognitive, performative divide is argue, arguably becoming... Uh, <clears throat> Bridgeable, courtesy of a shift on both sides. 
recent research, for example, on the hippocampus, recognizing, recognizes its seemingly distinct function as, on the one hand, a cognitive map, claimed to be a GPS system in the brain, and at the same time as working memory. And that suggests to me the need to acknowledge cognition and navigation having external environmental dimensions. And the link between the two, therefore, is the ordering of events in space and time through storytelling. So, <clears throat> this is a quote from the Dola Lab uh, a couple of years ago. Our brains, and more importantly, the hippocampus represents memories as networks of interrelated events with prominent spatial and non-spatial event, event elements, such as spatial locations and people, as nodes of these memory networks. We think these memory networks are the neural basis of navigation through space, but also through the landscape of our memories. <coughs> MRI research has moved on from mapping single brains in isolation to mapping multiple brains in interaction, likewise, <clears throat> uh, and trained through storytelling. Um, sorry, all right. This seems to be all right. Uh, meanwhile, uh, my, a very interesting recent book. Uh, on Wayfinding by Maureen O'Connor cites uh, some work by a guy called Kim Shaw Williams, unfortunately I don't know him, but uh, possibly her. Uh, social trackways theory is what she's talking about and that's about the theory of power and the origins of cognition and language. <coughs> and Trackways, i.e., the following of paths of other entities uh, through the environment, like hunters do, but following paths, in my view, through intellectual, mental, and performative landscapes. And once tracks became much used strategies for navigation, foraging, finding water, remembering routes, and hunting for animals, it led to humans creating rich mental maps of territories and routes based on narrative memory of previous experience and the experiences of others. Our memory capacities grew and we amassed more natural history information. The changing seasons, migration passion, patterns of animals, breeding cycles, habitats. Out of this process emerged a creature that could begin to organize its experiences in space and time, to navigate farther, to build complex maps and sequences in the brain and eventually, once they harness symbolic communication and language, to communicate these geographic and biographical narratives for themselves. <clears throat> the human mind just is a uniquely self-projecting, narratively trucking, wayfinding mind. And socially, we view our whole lives, our communities, our everyday routines, and our conversations as overtly explorative and cooperative what-if narrative journeys through space and time. From my perspective, that kind of approach through tracking our, our understanding our, our cognitive processes as following paths and at the same time creating paths and connections is a good step towards describing a different kind of space from the disembodied abstract space of Western science, a space that I, like uh, <coughs> Maria Russo, uh, professor of moral, moral philosophy in Rome, would call a hodological space, a lived, embodied space of action, but a kind of space that's culturally variable and social. <clears throat> Up until recently, all the research on neuroscience has been done on individual brains in isolation. Now, they've invented a technique called hyperscanning, where you can put multiple people into MRI machines and have them linked. And so you can have set up, as like in this situation here, where there's a storyteller in one machine, 
and a number of listeners in the other machines. And the same brain patterns start emerging in the, ma in the brain of the person who's reading and telling the story, and the same brain patterns start to occur in all these hyperlinked people. And it has now got this rather silly little name, mind melding, br sorry, brain melding. Um, but I think it's extremely telling and interesting that that's part of the function of storytelling. It's the way it links people together in a common understanding of what's going on in the world. And to quote uh, Thayer Wheatley, who's working on this, uh, social brains interact like a dance when partners take their own steps but move in concert, continuously adjusting and adapting. <coughs> And another guy who's working on it, Yuri Hassan at Princeton, says, brains don't work in isolation. They're built to communicate, to tell and hear stories and join with other brains linked through synchronization. So if we have an expanded framework of embodied cognition that includes the social and the cultural, navigation becomes a question of also orientation of knowing who we are as much as where we are. And the two are fundamental aspects of our physical and mental experience. So now I want to change gears and go to talk about recent revisions of the story we've been telling ourselves about how we left Africa. Understanding how humans originally developed capacity to move and orient themselves has been a story largely based in genetic and evolutionary prehistory of how we left Africa. In the standardized out of Africa story, a single species, modern Homo sapiens, originated in a specific region of the East African Rift Valley, where somewhere around 100,000 years ago, they left apparently occupying all the eco issues on the planet and not most noticeably replacing all varieties of homonyms, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and any other species that kept being discovered. Hence the name, the replacement model. This puts Homo sapiens, of course, in a very central position. But this linear dendritic out of Africa replacement model now looks to be replaced itself in favor of a much more interactive, rhizomatic, model along the lines of multi-regionalism. We now know that Homo sapiens interbred with other varieties of Homo, including Neanderthals and Denisovans. Furthermore, Homo sapiens is no longer exceptionally sapiens. Neanderthals were fully culturally modern well before human, sap human sapiens itself. So just to give you some examples, I'll run through them fairly quickly. Most importantly, from my point of view, Neanderthals invented string. String, along with stories, is one of the most fundamental human artifacts that gets almost no recognition at all because it's so boring and humdrum, you hardly notice it. But if you're going to have these things I've just shown you, external symbolization in the form, for example, of necklaces, you have to have string. And with string, Humans, as it were, are able to move into every eco niche on the planet. Elizabeth Barber, many years ago, wrote a beautiful book called Women's Work. And she said, there was not a Neolithic revolution, there was a string revolution. <laughs> when we learned, when our predecessors, in fact, it turns out, Neanderthals learned to make string, they were able to move. The important point about string and stories is that both of them are, in my view, technologies of connection. Stories join ideas together. String joins things together. And it's that process of connection that is the fundamental process of life itself and of cognition. In effect, I'm quoting Maturana and Varela, but not that they mention string. But string is extremely, extremely important, in my view, with it, you can make uh, nets, catch small animals, carry your children, and join 
uh, join things together like uh, arrowheads and that sort of thing. So, but, sorry, too fast. This is a recent discovery of a tool for making rope 40,000 years ago. This is the key device for, as it were, making your own microclimate that enables you to move. If you can sew your clothes together, you can move into virtually any environment within that created uh, clothing. And Neanderthals, and certainly Denisovans, 50,000 years ago, could do that. They could also make music and dance. And here's the most intriguing image that I really, really like currently claim it to be the oldest image in the world in a cave in Cantabria, La Passiega, definitely done by Neanderthals, not by sapiens. And I offer you the opportunity to interpret that. I would be pleased to hear what you think. Of course, absolutely nobody knows what it represents, if it represents anything. I think it's more performative than anything. But, leaving that this is, as it were, the most stunning example of what Neanderthals got up to in building complex structures. This is a kilometre and a half inside a cave. In other words, it's totally dark in there, even though, of course, there's artificial light showing you. These two complex structures that they built out of stalactites. So they not only were able to build complex structures deliberately, uh, but they also were able to have continuous light, sufficiently controlled flame and fire, in other words, to be able to go into that cave and work in the dark and build these sorts of things. All of which take what looks very much like the capacities we attribute to uh, modern humans. So, Neanderthals had language and culture, they sang, they made music, they danced, they feasted and celebrated, they probably told stories, with larger brains than ours, they buried their dead, cared for the old and sick, created external symbolization and art. They made string for beads and bone necklaces, needles to sew their clothes, and they ground ochre to paint their bodies and to make images. So, the whole story about their special excursion from Africa by Homo sapiens really doesn't hold up very well, but those of us who live in Australia will most recently have been exposed to a version of the standard out of Africa story, courtesy of his much advertised um, new book, uh, Lewis Dartnell's Origins, How the Earth Made Us. And <clears throat> this is a, an example of the, the, uh, an account of how we got to, to be, as it were, clever, that relies totally on the idea that everything originated in one specific place in one specific group and the rest of the world get out of the way. So here his view is that uh, Homo sapiens originated in the Rift Valley uh, in East Africa, which is roughly the Old Divide Gorge, roughly where Adam and Eve were supposed to have got it off if you believed in the old even Adam story. Uh, either the genetic, genetic one or the biblical one. And his claim is that because there was a unique set of environmental variations in the Rift Valley, there were ephemeral lakes that came and went and they acted as kind of amplifiers of our capacities to adapt. Uh, having developed this capacity to adapt to vi environmental change, we walked out of Africa and <clears throat> This is the standard model. You can see that uh, the rest of the world, as it were, succumbed to this movement out of Africa. And it was all, as it were, linear and dendritic, that continuous branchings off, uh, accounting for, as it were, the variety of humans around the world. However, uh, I mentioned earlier that there's a, a model called multi-regionalism, i.e. it's a, a rhizomatic uh, network model of human evolution and dispersal. 
where, as you can see in the Thorn and Walpath model, there's interactions between the varieties of species. In other words, varieties of homo left Africa over a continuous period. They were continuously interbreeding. And there was gene flow across the place, all over the place. And this theory, multi-regionalism, was much vilified and virtually kicked out of court by a group led by a guy called Chris Stringer. However, Chris Stringer and co have developed a new model, which they call, and most tellingly they call, African multi-regionalism. So we're all multi-regionalists now, according to this lot, and they're allowing for that kind of interactive, reticulated, rhizomatic model where all varieties of humans and their predecessors interbred, interacted, but much more importantly, they did not all originate in one place. Their, their, uh, their multi-regionalism is not what happened outside Africa, or not entirely outside Africa. It happened in Africa, in the sense that there are now sufficient uh, skeletal and artifactual remains to suggest that humans in their various varieties developed all over Africa. So that much of the stuff that has been found in the old Vry Gorge, for example, remains, as it were, viable, but very similar materials very similar artifacts were found, and very similar skeletal remains were found in Morocco, completely on the other side of Africa, but also all along the south coast of Africa. So you've got, in their view, varieties of humans interacting on occasion, interbreeding, but most importantly, exchanging cultural uh, traits and uh, artifacts. So the human uh, varieties are in fact an ad hoc assemblage out of varieties that continue to interact as they spread out of Africa. And just as uh, for instance, you've got some of what's claimed to be the earliest art from the Blombos Cave on the South African coast where uh, the, they have incised ochre and ochre used to uh, paint rock. Uh, if that's a painting, it's a, certainly a marking of some kind. And in the uh, southern part of the Rift Valley, the deep south side, there was once, as it were, a verdant lake complex. Now there's an arid desert, but in the excavations that they've been doing there, they found stone tools, coloured pigments, and evidence that these tools and the pigments came from quite substantial distances away. So they were trading in trading networks. This is 300,000 years ago. That is not just yesterday. That is not like the standard story which had us leaving Africa more or less with a very restricted kit 100,000 years ago. The whole understanding of human prehistory and the development of cognition has been totally changed. And the thing that stands out most for me about this transition is that it's the, the iteration, the constant use of the word mosaic. It's a mosaic assemblage of bits and pieces. And <coughs> So, the genetic model gets to change, as well as the geological and the archaeological model. But it is even more complicated than that. Because, of course, the Chinese have never believed that humans originated in Africa. The natural place for the origin of humans, of course, has always been China. No problem. However, we have now got some evidence to support this kind of claim. It's still, as it were, contested, but here are some human teeth, 120,000 years old, from China. And this is what a new model would look like, uh, if you believe the Daily Mail. Uh, that there was a massive dispersal and interaction where people were coming from out of China, maybe Homo erectus originated in China, 
interactions along the way with the Denisovans, the Neanderthals, mostly, mostly the Neanderthals went into Europe, the Denisovans went into Asia, but we now find Denisovan genes in Australian Aborigines and so on. The complex interactions going on all over the place, especially uh, old materials coming out of China. And this is the ultimate example of a mosaic skull, so to speak. That is to say, this is the Dali skull, which is found in China, <coughs> uh, and it's now dated to 260,000 years ago. And some of the features in that skull uh, have, the same, have the same characteristics as the skull that was found in Morocco. So there has been, as it were, this mosaic interactive co-production of the variability of the environment and the context and human uh, cognitive capacities right round the globe. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the other most important uh, dimension of this new model, courtesy of one of the guys, there's a group of people who written this paper about the African multi-regional view of the world. And one of the central players is a guy called Francisco uh, Garrido, who's head of archaeological research in France. And he says that one of the consequences of this kind of understanding is we should no longer see genes as the driver of human evolution and development. The driver, according to him, is in fact culture, not Genes. Genes in this kind of model would be seen more as the repository of experience rather than the former of experience. It, human capacity is to do things like make art, uh, make uh, tools, uh, have social interactions, collaboration, create culture, is what shapes the brain. The brain then solidifies, so to speak. Uh, these kinds of processes, rather than you having to have pre-wired some cultural gene capacity. It's the other way around. You are shaped, we are shaped in our interactions with each other, the environment, and with our ways of making it ourselves, which is very much like uh, the Malafurus view of the world. We bring the world, and Matrimon and Varela, we bring the world into being through what we make and it not only shapes the world, it shapes us. That's the driver. And I think this new model, this completely revolutionary understanding of the origins of human <coughs> uh, mental capacities, I think frees us all enormously to move on to the next thing, which of course is that given that we're not hardwired, we're all actually rather different because of course, we're not only individually different, but we're culturally different, and then we have very diverse ways of being in the world and understanding it and knowing it. So that leads me to the thing that is quite interesting in terms of how do we really know when two completely different ways of understanding and seeing the world meet? And <clears throat> this is Tupaya's chart. Tupaya was the leading Polynesian navigator who drew a map of 74 islands in the Pacific for Captain Cook. And they sailed together from Tahiti to New Zealand and Australia in 1769. Uh, everybody's been unable, as it were, to read this map. It's very hard to understand how it makes some kind of sense. Did we get the ordination is wrong. Like it's very easy to confuse things when you're translating from English into an unfamiliar language. When somebody says, uh, that's the north wind, do they mean it's going from the north or do they mean it's going to the north? What, where's north? You know, what, what, do they understand what north is? Is north a concept? Do they do ordinality? You, know, you don't know. So the map has been attempted to be translated in various kinds of ways, like switching the ordinality round, that sort of thing. But how come some islands are apparently in the wrong place? How come they seem to be doubling up in some cases? And 
so on. So this is a very, very important rereading of the, this chart that I want to tell you about. Um, and how can we see it? Can, can we understand it as somehow a melding of two completely different ontologies, two <coughs> completely different ways of knowing and understanding the world? Uh, but let me tell you a bit about Tupai. <coughs> Tupai uh, came on, got on the boat in Tahiti. And on the boat, in the Endeavour, there were three artists, including Parkinson and Pickerskill, and they had partly enabled Tupai to draw, to learn to draw, and use paper and ink. And uh, there are a whole collection of drawings that have only recently been discovered to be uh, by Tupai. This famously is a cartoon that he drew of Joseph Banks exchanging a lobster with a Maori, or Maori exchanging a lobster. And what is it in Captain uh, in Joseph Banks' hand? Probably a piece of bark cloth, but maybe it's a handkerchief. And if you go for symbolic understanding, it's a, an exchanging a lobster, which is supposed to represent knowledge, and um, a handkerchief, which is supposed to represent civility, is a possible interpretation. But when uh, Joseph Banks was reflecting on this drawing himself when he was president of the Royal Society. He said, uh, my understanding of exchange is work being well illustrated by Tupai in his drawing of me. The, the, the fundamental principle of exchange is you must have hold of what you're going to get before you let go of what you're going to give. That's a very colonial understanding of what this exchange <laughs> looks like. But I think uh, it's profoundly important. It's the earliest example we have of an indigenous person drawing deliberately an, uh, a white person, a, co a colonialist, uh, interacting with an indigenous person. And I think there's a hint of mockery and uh, self-awareness buried in that. And <clears throat> so... Um, this is a cutaway model of the endeavour on which Tupai and Cook drew the map. If you can see the sort of green carpet at the back, that's the great cabin, and you probably can't see it all that well, but within that there is a table on which this map was drawn. And that's the table on the replica of the endeavour in Sydney. So roughly that table is sort of maybe a little bit bigger than this space here. But I want you to imagine what it's like to be at that table if you're cooking to pie. There is po possibly 11 other people could be working at this table and they're going to be doing things like skinning birds and um, drying leaves and drawing seascapes and mapping and eating and all that in this one small space. This is where Cook and Tupai together do this map. And <clears throat> according to Foucault, you know, the ship is a heterotopia. Uh, and being a heterotopia in his terms means that a boat is <coughs> has not only been for our civilization um, from the 16th century until the present, the great instrument of economic development, but has been simultaneously the greatest reserve of the imagination. The ship is a heterotopia par excellence, where multiple forms of spatiality mix together. That's what. <coughs> uh, uh, that's what Foucault, Foucault would say about it. And this is uh, sort of a telling example of how fundamentally important the Polynesian navigational system is. This is a, a replica voyage, replica canoe that was built in Hawaii some 40 years ago now, which was able to repeat all the, all the original voyages using no instruments, no charts, 
no compasses. So the, the profound power of the Polynesian system is a real challenge to the Western understanding. Western understanding has that you cannot know the world without uh, measuring, without calculation, and without accurate, um, precise, and objective maps. Polynesians were, in fact, able to discover uh, for the very first time what well, something like uh, one third of the world without any of the apparatus that constitutes modernity and what counts as Western rationality. So, to get to the chart itself and the new re reading, this is a detail from the centre of the chart. You see those two lines that cross. That's the north, south, east, west line, the two ones, right? That were almost certainly put on the map by Cook, and then Cook would have said to Pyre, please put in the islands where you think they are. You'll see at the cross point something called Abate. Well, Abate is a fiction. There is no island there. And everybody's gone, what's all this? What is Avatea? How can we possibly explain that? Well, on the new reading, that Avatea is a fiction invented by Tupai. It's not actually part of the traditional uh, Polynesian navigational system. It was invented by Tupai to enable him to impose on the Western coordinate system his understanding of how the world is. From his understanding of how you navigate, <coughs> the world, he is on his canoe, he is stationary, but the world is moving towards him. But it's actually also rotating. So he observed that Captain Cook at midday on boat, on his boat, on the Endeavour, would shoot you know, the sun's position, mark the sun's position. Everything that Cook did about, as it were, working out his own geolocation depended on having the sun overhead at midday. Uh, <coughs> so Tupai is standing there watching this and thinking, yeah, well, it's actually very important where the sun is at midday is actually the axis, if you think of it as a vertical line coming down like this in the tropics. It's the axis around which his world is turning. In other words, from his point of view, that is the north. The nor north is at the centre of the map, not at the top or the bottom or anywhere else. It's in the middle. And the world, the way you navigate is you've got to learn, as it were, the, the, di the directions to particular islands from where you are. And you do that by learning the star positions, stars rise and fall. And <clears throat> more or less continuously at a particular spot on the horizon. That's the way to that, to that island. But at the same time, you've got to know where you are relative to where you left. So if you see the arc from, as the world's moving back to the soul, this pole, this is in his head, he's inventing it this way. You can position all the islands. So essentially, he's drawing a map trying to hybridise with the Western tradition in a way that shows how to get the, the map from his point of view is a set of sailing directions as opposed to a set of positions. So it's, a, it's, it's based in bodily movement, it's based in, as it were, <laughs> knowing your environment int intimately, but he's trying to impose his understanding of the world onto Cook's map. So Cook's map can now be, or Tupai's and Cook's chart can now be read as a kind of melding of two different ontologies. And uh, what's so interesting about this, I think, is the question of how did this happen? I mean, what in practice is really going on trying to form a connection with uh, what Trish was saying? That is to say, what they're doing, of course, is drawing, right? But they're drawing in two completely different traditions. But they're drawing together. It's, a, it's an act of collaborative drawing rather than being an expression simply of an individual point of view. It's trying to tell each other, in effect, or 
Tristan's terms, making visible to each other each their, each their own understanding of how you know something in the world. They do have a lot in common, in point of fact. Cook was himself raised in a, tradi in a tradition very like the Polynesian one, in the sense that he learned to navigate in the North Sea on colliers. Uh, colliers are rather clunky, heavy-duty vehicles for moving coal. And in fact, the endeavour itself was a colliery. But if you're sailing in the North Sea, <coughs> you don't bother much about charts and things like that because they're not much use because everything keeps changing all the time. And there's massive variability. Trying to sail up and down the east coast of England is a nightmare. There's a huge tidal range and mud banks moving all the time. And everything changes. The winds are violent and sudden, suddenly variable. And you've got, of course, to avoid you know, getting stuck. But the way you do it is very much like the way the Polynesians do it. And in fact, nearly all of us, when we're navigating, they're taking very, paying very close attention to the specifics of the local environment, the context. So Cook learned to navigate using what's called the three L's. Lead, look at, and local knowledge. Lead means you have a piece of lead on the string, but on the bottom of the lead is some tallow, some wax. When you lower it, it hits the bottom and it tells you whether it's mud or sand or neither of the above. My God, we were in Doggerland or whatever. Uh, look out, of course, that's a guy at the top of the mast who's constantly trying to see whether you're about to run into something. And local knowledge means you just know absolutely everything there is to know about this particular estuary and the rise and fall of the water. And when you when you could safely go in and when you could safely go out. So Cook then goes, leaves the commercial navy, the merchant marine, so to speak, joins the Royal Navy, goes to the uh, uh, St. Lawrence River in the Seven Years' War against the French, maps the whole entrance to Quebec, and that's how we beat the French in Canada as an English possession. Uh, and then he learned himself a whole technique for cartographic mapping at sea, coastal surveying, using a plane table. He then transferred, as it were, transformed into being one of the world's greatest cartographers. But of course, when he went to Tahiti, he was in fact trying to make that tradition, the new tradition by calculation, work effectively. But it couldn't work very well because there's no way of calculating longitude, which is roughly speaking how far along are you, as it were, along the longitude. And that needed uh, a clock, an accurate clock. He did not have an accurate clock. He had a big standing clock that he took to Tahiti and had to build a special place for it, but it wouldn't work on the boat because it's a pendulum. <coughs> he had to calculate his position uh, by observing the moon, but it took four hours on every day to be able to do that calculation. So the grand plan of knowing everything about the position of the whole globe and items in it had not yet come to completion. He completed that, as it were, on the second voyage when he had Harrison's watch to measure time. So these two traditions in collision on this boat get, as it were, melded together in a process of becoming. Both traditions are in development. Both of them don't have the total, as it were, understanding of what it is to be able to bring their own tradition <coughs> into visibility. They are, as it were, collaborating in that process. By drawing it together, things about their own understandings, which you can see in, these are some of Tupai's drawings. Um, this is the map that they drew together of the society islands. And if you get up into the details, you can see different modes of sketching. One of them is sort of the Western technique that um, Cook developed, because you've got to be able to imagine what the coast looks like as you can see it from the sea as well as from above. You can't, you know, you've got to know what it looks like in order to be able to say you're in the right place. 
and Cook's way of doing it quite different from, <coughs> from Tupaya's way of doing it. So these drawings are, as it were, an example of collaborative uh, ontological interchange. And that is what you need if you're going to imagine different ways of moving and being in the world uh, and to get to the point that uh, <coughs> navigation is a, f an, a direct expression of human cognition, uh, that all cognitive processes are ba based in uh, action and movement. Profound, vast parts of the brain are just devoted to movement itself, but bodily movement, bodily prehension, that there are there's no reason to believe in the idea that there's a GPS in the brain. GPS in the brain may or may not exist. There are certainly cells that register position and so on, but they mean nothing in separation from the context, the environment. You have to have a whole way of doing that. But the way of do ways of doing that, lacking our understanding of the environment in terms of our ways of knowing what the external are, the externalities are, what the contexts are. That's culturally very, very variable. And the great mistake, of course, is the Western way of thinking of it is that we actually do know everything and it's all mappable. And the great dream is we will end up with a map of everything and we are constantly doing it. We are constantly thinking. If we just map the human brain, just map the biometric bi bio bio variability of uh, gut microbes and so on, we can know everything. The idea being that once you can do that, you can sit in bed and just look at the map or look at Google Maps and you control the world. But, <coughs> as everybody knows, that's just not good enough. So I will leave you with this assembly of, scattered assembly of stories. Stories are what joins everything together. Stories order events in space and time. And I've just uh, told you three different stories about how we do that. Thank you.